Well, thank you, Pastor Bill, Kathy, for your hospitality. Always wonderful to be here. Special blessing to have Kathy and Norm, longtime friends, dear, dear people to us. So Jana and I are co-pastors in a church in Wheaton. So we live in Wheaton, a city of 50,000 people, 30 miles due west of the Central Business District in Chicago, Illinois. So it's a city of 50,000 with over 50 evangelical churches. Uh, that's not counting mainline or Catholic or Orthodox. So you go into any restaurant, and Kathy and Bill have been in some of those restaurants with us, and there's somebody somewhere praying or studying the Bible. So it's a highly, highly Christianized city. And we have been there uh, 20 years uh, working at the university, Intercultural Studies. We have two MA programs, one teaching English as a second language and one looking at uh, MA in mission. So we have, a, since I've been there, a thousand alums all over the world serving Christ, some in incredibly difficult situations. So we also had the joy in the last seven years to be co-pastors at the Wheaton Chinese Alliance Church. And they have three congregations, and we were looking after the English. So most Sundays, I'd need to share a little word. And we do it by looking at books or characters of the Bible. So a couple of summers ago, we were looking at the Gospel of Mark. So I had read it and reread it and read it a number of months before. We actually started on June 1. And then section by section, we're looking at how Mark was communicating the fact that Jesus is God and Jesus is totally human. So I was preparing to talk on Mark 4, and that is the parable of the sower, and you're very familiar with that. That is, four soils, they are the difference, differences in the parable. Mark 4, Matthew 13, Luke 8 it is a similar parallel parables, but I was functioning out of Mark chapter 4, and there's the seed, the Word of God, Jesus teaches, that fell on the the road, and Satan came down and plucked it away. And then on the rocks, and the sun beat down, you know, persecutions and suffering. People take the word of God and then give up. And then there's the seed that goes into the thorns, and then the seed that goes onto the good ground. So you're familiar with the parable of the sower. So I was talking about Mark chapter 4 and the parable. And the Saturday before, I'd been meditating, thinking about it, looking at the whole, coming back to the particular I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what I was going to say to the congregation that morning. 150, 15 languages, Chinese ethnicity, predominant, 80% millennials, 15 to 35 years of age. That was our congregation. Very fun, fun congregation. I went to bed on the Saturday night without a real clear answer. God, what do you want to say? 1.30 in the morning, I woke up. And my vintage is such that that is not unusual. But I didn't get out of bed. I just lay there. And the thought came across my mind, just a sentence. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper beside my bed. And I didn't get out of bed. I went back to sleep straight away. Maybe an hour later, I woke up again. And another sentence came through my mind, and I wrote it down and went back to bed. That was a good night. I really didn't get out of bed much at all. I just woke up, wrote it down, went back to bed, woke up, wrote it down, went back to bed. In the morning, I looked at the scribble beside my bed on the pad and tried to work out what was it. <laughs> so I, I eventually deciphered it, and it was two sentences that in reflection... I believe it was God speaking to me for what he wanted to say that particular morning. And it was to do with the parable in Mark 4 of the sower. And it was consistent with what I felt God was saying to me out of the parable. It wasn't inconsistent with the teaching of Jesus. And that is the first sentence. God has designed the seed to produce. That is the Word of God. God has designed, that was an operative word, the seed 
to produce. Then the second sentence was, it is our responsibility to protect the seed. There wasn't a third sentence, but if there was a third sentence, it is this, that as you protect the seed, the word of God that is deposited in your heart, then God will produce and bless what he wants to do through your life. And I don't think, in reflection, it's just for individuals. I'll speak to you brother to brother, brother to sister in a moment, but also I think it's consistent with families, and also institutions and organizations. Those truths need to be looked at for organizations and families and individuals who are followers of Jesus. So we could talk about Satan plucking the word. We could talk about rocky ground persecution and suffering causing us to give up and turn our back on the word of God. But I want to focus today just on the thorns, because I think the majority of us here have been following Jesus hand in hand for one year, two, three, 30, 40 years. And the thorns, we need to pause a little bit and have a medical checkup, a soul checkup concerning the thorns that can easily strangle the Word of God and make us unproductive for what God's purpose and grace has called us to do. So let me talk to you as a brother this morning and talk to you in a fashion that makes you reflect on your own life and have a checkup on your soul and your relationship with God and how the Word of God is producing God's desires in your heart and in your life. So when we talk about thorns, Matthew, Mark and Luke are very consistent. I take the teaching of Jesus very seriously. Jesus is alive, he's risen from the dead, and where two or three are gathered together, there is he in the midst. And he's here this morning, the spirit of Jesus is here. And I'm standing before you and you're graciously listening to me, but it's Jesus also with me, in me, above me, below me, on my side, on my right, on my back, on my front, that is speaking to us this morning. He says, if you do not understand this parable, then you will not understand any parable. That gets my attention. And then when he says, you can receive the word of God, and you can go forth, so you're in action, you're in process, you're following Jesus. And then thorns can grow up, and it's insidious, it's slow, it's subtle. Often it's internal rather than external. External, I think you can, you can work out when Satan's trying to pluck the word of God. You can work out persecutions and suffering and bend your knee and yield and surrender and ask for God's infusing strength to go through those difficulties and challenges. Those external issues, I don't think that's where you're up to. Some of you have gone through horrific, horrific tragedies and suffering. And you're here this morning with your hands raised up and you're rejoicing. I don't think that's what we need to focus on. It's the quiet, subtle thorns that we don't even know are growing around us and sucking the life out of the Word of God and what God wants to produce. And one of the things He wants to produce is Christ-likeness. There's a consistency, and here are the thorns that Jesus warned us about. Cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and desires, sometimes translated lusts of things. Cares of the world, desires for riches, and lusts for things. So this morning, 
my wife and I are just going to share briefly and just present, just present some thoughts. I don't want you to rake over your life. I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit with the ear of your heart. I'm not here to condemn. Jesus, with the woman caught in adultery, said, anyone accuse you? I don't either. I'm not condemning you, but go and live a holy life. So I'm not pointing my finger or condemning anybody this morning. I have a gum tree out of my ear. I'm very well aware, or my eye. I'm not here to judge. I've got a whole gum tree. I'm here to present. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Show us, reveal, illuminate to our hearts and minds what are the thorns that we need to be really careful of that can choke what you want to do. In your home group, in your Sunday school class, in the youth group, in the board of ministries, in committees here in this church, it's not just related to individuals, families. There's organizational thorns as well. I don't know what they are. But my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will show you. That's a part of his role. Our approach, we're just going to give you some examples. I've prayed about what examples. I could give a list of different thorns that I've seen in the last so many years that have choked the life out of people. They're no, f no longer following Jesus. They're not finishing strong. They're not finishing well. Started out strong. Cares of the world. Worries. Conflict. Faction. Fiction. Friction that can come against us in our life as we go forth that often produces a holding on to, a clenching, a judging of situation and cares and worries rather than a release for God to judge. It's called unforgiveness and forgiveness. Every year, every church needs a medical checkup, a soul checkup on forgiveness. My wife and I met my sister. I'm saying this out front because I want to share my own family and I don't mind if they hear it, what I'm about to say, because they need to hear it. So my sister comes from Western Australia to spend a few hours with us knowing we're here and she shares a few things regarding nephews and nieces here in Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. Now, my nephews and nieces are now in their 50s. And all the people that I'm talking about right now are devoted, committed, Sunday attending Christians that love God, without a doubt. So I've got a group in Victoria nephew and wife in their 50s that have a number of children now in their 20s and the two eldest daughters who are following Jesus recently got married. And my nephew and his wife never attended the wedding of their two eldest daughters who are marrying Christian, fine Christian men but I didn't attend because the men, who are now their son-in-laws, didn't meet a standard, didn't meet a religious standard that was acceptable to them. You understand, they're Christian. They're following Jesus. Every people, every person I'm talking about loves God. They will not accept the son-in-laws to come into the house. They've cut themselves off from their own daughter, daughters, plural, and son-in-laws. I'm saddened to say 
this is not an isolated incident. I've been holding Jesus' hand for a few decades. I've got too many stories. Right now, floating through my head, I can give you three more instances of this happening in Christian homes. Where does love God, love your neighbor come into this? Where does forgiveness come into this? When you say you're following Jesus and you're holding on to resentment and you're choking, you're choking your soul and you're imprisoning yourself. The whole of Matthew 18 talks about this. It talks about the relationship between brother and brother and sister and sister affects, directly affects your relationship to God. It directly affects the blessing of God. It directly affects your prayer life. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. If you ask anything of my name, then I'll give it to you. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. When it is loosed in earth, is loosed in heaven. It's talking about forgiveness. It's not talking about power encounter with the demonic. Not in Matthew 18. Matthew 16, maybe. The whole of the chapter is relationship, one with another, that affects your relationship to God. God cannot fully bless you if you have resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, not letting loose people that have hurt you. At the very end of Matthew 18, it says this after the parable of the steward that was forgiven $1 million and then went out and found a person that owed him $1 and threw him into prison. The very last verse of Matthew 18 says, If you do not... This is Jesus speaking this morning. Forgive your brother and sister, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you. What? I'm forgiven. <laughs> I've changed my allegiance to Jesus, ransomed many. His blood has cleansed me from all sin. Yeah, this is talking about ongoing, going forth relationship with God. So that's, that's my first point. Don't rake it up. Meaning, just relax right now in your spirit, soul. Just float down the river, the river of God's love. But if somebody, <laughs> some event is popping up into your head, you've got to do something about it because it's a thorn. And that thorn can cripple you. That thorn can imprison you that God cannot loose his blessing on you but is bound in heaven because you're binding on, a, on earth. That's the meaning of the verse. What you bind on earth, look at my hand, God's bound in heaven. He can't bless you. What you loose on earth, forgive, then he will loose it from heaven. His blessing. There's another thorn concerning Desires for things. Well, Luke talks about lusts. Jane is going to come and share. Sometimes I get intense in my sharing. That's why I'm bringing up Jane. And now, gracious, loving, caring, <laughs> softening you up for the next round when I get up. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> It's great to be here with you. Um, in the last couple months, I've been really aware of margins in my life. Let me just tell you what I mean by margins. So when I say margins, I'm talking about times during the day when you might be in between something, where you're not doing something. So in Wheaton, where we live, we have a, a railroad track that runs right through the middle of our town. So whenever you go anywhere in the city, you inevitably get caught by a train. And so, you know, you're sitting there and you have to wait for a train. And sometimes there's two going by. So then you're waiting double time. So that's a margin. Margin is when you're in between doing something and, and you're just there. 
So I've realized that every morning when I wake up in the morning, that's a margin for me. I wake up, I'm laying in bed, and it's a little margin. But I also realize that every morning, the very first thing that I do is I pick up my phone. And I check to see if my daughters have texted me. I look at the weather, because weather is very important in Chicago. I look at my Facebook. I'll just skim through, through the news real quick. It doesn't take me long, 10, 15 minutes. But my day is imprinted by what I see on my phone. I'm not even, I haven't even gotten out of bed yet. And that's the very first thing I do. I've also noticed that any chance of downtime during the day, so these margins that I'm talking about, the same thing was happening. So one of my margins is um, at a doctor's office. You know, I'm waiting to be called back to a doctor's office. The first thing I do while I'm waiting is I, I pick up my phone. I'm sitting at a stoplight of all places. I can't sit at a stoplight without picking up my phone. I don't know what your margins are. I mean, maybe you're a young mom and you have kids, and one of your margins is while your kids are playing in the park. I don't know. I don't know what your margins are. I found that I was building this habit of anti-boredom. Like, I couldn't just exist. I couldn't just relax. And I also found that as I went throughout my day, there was this constant flow of just stimulation and news and entertainment. It was just constant. So one night, I was on Facebook, and um, I was getting ready to go to bed, and I was just you know, spending some time on Facebook, and so I finally shut it down, and I'm laying in bed, and my body is just buzzing. I'm like, Bzzz. I mean, I'm just buzzing. And I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I must have had coffee today. I must have had caffeine too late in the day, and now it's affecting me, and I can't get to sleep. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking through, you know, did I have coffee? And, you know, no, I, I hadn't had coffee. And this little thought came into my head, you've been on the Internet way too long. So I, I finally went to sleep that night, and uh, very similar to Rob, I, I woke up in the middle of the night. And in the middle of the night, there was this question just floating through my head. So I jumped up, I ran over to my desk, and I wrote it down on a little sticky note, and jumped back to in bed and went to sleep, and slept till the morning. So the next morning, I get up and I, I do my thing. I, I've got my phone, I check all the things I need to check, I finally roll out of bed, I walk over to my desk, and here's the sticky note, and I haven't even remembered that I got up in the night. No recollection of getting up, and it's sitting there with the, the question on it. This, this happens to be <laughs> the original sticky note. I brought it all the way with me. This is, this is the question. If every resting moment is filled with social media, when do you have time for prayer? That wasn't coming from me. That was coming from the Holy Spirit. And I stood there convicted. I stood there saddened um, by the fact that not only was my day imprinted by my phone, but every margin of my day, every free minute I had was imprinted by what I was looking at. And it wasn't bad stuff but it was just all consuming, never allowing my soul and my spirit to be touched by the Holy Spirit, to let God speak to me in my day, throughout my day, 
to have this intimate interaction with him. I, I, don't, I, I never allowed a chance for him to do that. So I, I stand here sharing one of my thorns. <laughs> it's not a thorn I'm proud of, but it's a thorn that has snuck in very, very silently. Didn't even realize it. And, and really, with the help of the Lord, I've put into practice some things that have helped me n pull away from that. And, and I'm new. I'm new at it, actually. It's only been a couple months. Just getting used to what that looks like. So now I have, a, I have this card. I, I brought this with me. I have a card above my bed on my headboard. So every morning... I grab this card, and, and this is what I imprint myself with instead of my phone. It happens to be the verse that the Lord led me to that morning. So after I read the question and I was so just saddened by it, uh, he led me to this awesome verse. And it's a really unlikely verse that at first I was like, what does this have to do with anything? And then it just hit me. So it's the, the last two verses of Zechariah's prophecy. And it's uh, in Luke, in Luke 1. And it's just this beautiful, Zechariah has just finally got his voice back after naming John the Baptist. And it's this beautiful outburst and prayer from Zechariah. And this is, the, this is what the Lord gave me to help me pull away from my phone. This is it. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is, a, is about to break upon us. That's Jesus. That's just awesome, isn't it? It's awesome. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. I don't know about you, but I have my times where I sit in the shadow of death and, and darkness and I want that path of peace. And so, so this, is, this is what I look at every morning. This is what imprints my day. This idea that Jesus is breaking forth in the morning light. This is what, this is, this is how I've remedied it, remedied it. Thanks. We're talking about the parable of the sower, focusing on thorns that will choke the word of God because many of you have gone forth for many years and we just need a soul check. We're talking about cares, cares of the world that can easily lead to unforgiveness and hanging on. And so what do you do? 1 Peter 2.23, Jesus on the cross is a life verse for me. Okay, you say, well, let loose, forgive, don't hang on to bitterness, grudge, grudges, so that God's blessing will fully be upon us. How do you do that? 1 Peter 2.23, on the cross, in his humanity, handling anger and bitterness and resentment, even demonic forces, Colossians 3. Jesus kept on entrusting himself to the righteous judge. He didn't retaliate, didn't spit back, didn't hit back. This is what he did. He prayed. Kept on entrusting himself. And you see it in... Luke chapter 23, the death prayers of Jesus, out of the Psalms. In order for God to be the judge of the situation and not him, which speaks to me. We're talking about the creator of the heaven and earth. We're talking about the son of God, the only begotten, the beloved of God. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. On the cross, how did he handle what could have easily been a clutching unforgiveness and resentment? He made it a prayer for God to be the judge. Not us, but God. And sometimes that's a process. You've got to keep throwing it up, throwing it up in prayer, throwing up, th throwing up, and then it won't come back. What happens is that you get emotionally hurt. You know what you should do. Matthew 6, Matthew 18 Jesus' teaching, but your emotions have been hurt. 
And as you make it a prayer, there will come a time when God will take out the sting of the emotion. You know that you have been hurt badly, unjustly treated, spoken of. You remember, you don't forget, but you give it to God and it's gone. And the emotional hurt is gone. We live in Chicago. Chicago has ice and snow, January, February, March. A couple of years ago, I slipped on ice, fell backwards with my left hand and broke my arm. Jana was watching when I did this. And then I went to Spokane to visit our two eldest daughters, Sarita and Louisa, and it's ice and snow, and they wanted to walk outside. I said, you've got to look after me. I've just broken my left wrist. Oh, Dad, it'll be okay. No problem. And as we were crossing the road in front of their flat on a slope, I had Louisa and Sarita left and right holding me as we went across the slippery, icy road. I said, hang on, I'm, you remember my left broken wrist? Oh, Dad, no, it's okay, no, it's all right. And then we began to slide. <laughs> they left their dad <laughs> by himself. And I fell. And I broke my right hand. <laughs> It's probably one of the lowest <laughs> moments in my life, lying on the ground. And it, this one got broken, and I wasn't too sure. When this one broke, I was sure. And I was lying, I've broken my wrist again. Oh, she should be right, Dad. Come on, Dad, get up. You remember Serena and Louisa, don't you? <laughs> You know, that was completely shattered. And I had to have, if you come up and shake hands to me later, I'll show you my scar. You can line up here and I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> it's four inches long with nine pins. I remember, but the pain isn't there. I can't remember the pain. Same, make it a prayer. <laughs> Let God judge. You remember the hurt, but God will take out the emotional pain. I have one more little thing to say, and this is just one very short piece regarding desires for things. You know, Jana talking about technology. It's amoral. I mean, iPhone. I grew up on cartoons and American TV shows where they, they spoke to people on television 100 kilometers away. Now I'm speaking to Sarita from Sri Lanka and she's in Portland, Oregon, and I'm looking at her face. What we saw in cartoons decades ago is reality. And technology is, my goodness, how do they do that? <laughs> it's amazing, amazing. It's amoral. So a fire can warm you, cold night, or it can burn your house down. Technology is the same. I mean, if you don't control it, we have been through a little trip, India and Thailand and Sri Lanka to here, and everywhere we went, going underground, railway, billboards on the side of the road, they're advertising one thing, iPhones. And they're advertising specifically, focused on selfies. They are developing special iPhones to encourage people to take multiple selfies. That's to do with capitalism. When we went to India, national front page, first page I read, first paper, addiction to social media. Addiction national in India to taking selfies. Addiction. And we smile and say, really? 
people taking 30 or 40 selfies a day, putting it on Facebook, all related to their self-image or how they look. It can become an addiction. And in Thailand, in Thailand, blatant, all on, the, all on the underground train, beautiful system, all to do with selfies and iPhones. You look across and there are eight people opposite you in the train carriage. Every, every one is on an iPhone, without exception. Same in Sri Lanka. We spoke before about ministering at the Chinese church. Just very, very short. Many of the people were addicted to web games and iPhones. And I'm not saying that to be melodramatic. It's a fact. And they committed Christians, regular attendance at church, following Jesus. But I know, and they know that I know, that they spent so much time. We're talking not just young teenagers. We're talking people in their 30s and 40s come home from work, go straight to the computer and ignore their children and ignore their spouse. And they know it and they can't do anything about it. And I'm not talking pressing a button, getting pornography. That's altogether another story. But that's rampant, and it's not going to go away in Christian circles. We're living in a very interesting age. So here's my challenge. If God is prompting you and nudging you concerning unforgiveness, then begin a prayer and talk to him and describe the situation that you're carrying in your soul, the emotional hurt that you haven't let go and let him be the judge. Just describe it. Of course, he's all-knowing. All he knows about it, but make it a prayer in a few moments. If this technology encouragement to consider and reflect, if this speaks to you, here's my challenge. Don't touch it for three days. Now, this is not God speaking. I don't know where I get three days from. <laughs> but give it a go. If this is nudging, if the Holy Spirit is nudging you and saying, it could be you, that could be a thorn that is stopping the word that I've planted in your heart to produce what I want to produce in you, at your workplace, in amongst your family members, in amongst your children, that's you. If there's a little, little nudge, then this is what I want you to do. I want you to prayerfully consider not touching any technology for three days. Go cold turkey. <laughs> Why not? I had in my office a wonderful missionary, pastor, loves God, beautiful wife, beautiful wife, intelligent, spiritual, beautiful children, and he was addicted to pornography had to go through counseling before we could ordain him and commission him in cross-cultural work, which he did. And he is a recovering sex addict. There came a time across the desk or in front face-to-face -face, where I said, you need to cut it off. And that is cut off your computer. Jesus taught hyperbole but said, if you're heading towards eternal fire, then you cut off your arm. If you're heading to eternal damnation and separation from the one true living God, then you cut off a limb that's causing that to happen. It's a hyperbole. It's literature. It's poetry. Strong poetry. I said, you need to cut off the computer and withdraw from the computer because you're traveling around Chicago, iPhone and laptop, and at any moment you can draw up pornography. At any moment. Whereas before, when I was a little boy, it was tough to get pornography. You had to go through all sorts of processes. Now it's just a finger. And sometimes you can't get off that. It just keeps coming and you're trying to delete it and get out and it's there. And it's so subtle it can grab you. And you know what they say is the greatest addiction. It's not alcohol. It's not drugs. It's sexual pornography. It's the greatest addiction. It changes your thinking. It changes 
the neurology in your brain. That's more than a thorn. That's evil. It needs to be resisted with every piece of energy we've got. And we need to help one another and have accountability and prayerful and talk straight. Because many of you have got anointing and gifts of God that are being suppressed and you're sitting on them and you wonder why. We've given you a few thoughts this morning. Pastor Bill. Pastor Bill.